When it's all over, when it has run its course, the herd insanity, intoxication of gathering crowds, of yelling in crowds and waving banners in groups, when this sickness of the times, which makes a virtue of man's basest instincts, has vanished. When people, although they are no wiser, have grown weary. When all the disputes about fascism and communism have fought themselves out. And when the last freedom-loving emigrant has gone. Then one day it will become very modern to be liberal. Was there anything in that video that jumped out that you remember from the song? Nothing? Okay. <laughs> I'm opening it to the wider audience. Let it, begin Let it begin with me. Anything else? What is to begin with me? Okay. Now, I wish that somebody on this floor here with me, and then we'll take a popcorn kind of thing from the group. <laughs> um, when you hear the word peace, what does that bring to mind? What does that mean to you, the word peace, the concept peace? Nonviolence, absolutely. Any other additions to that? No wars. Coexistence. Quiet. Justice. Getting along with other people. Now, problems with communication instead of fighting. Aha, paramount. Communication instead of fighting. So that about sums up the lyrics to this song, which was, by the way, written in 1955. I was a senior in high school. Um, just an aside. <laughs> All right. Um, so when this piece that you have defined and it's supposed to start with you, me, 
What does that mean? And how can we do that? It's a hard question to answer. What can I do alone, by myself? What can I do or you do to facilitate or make peace true? Yes, Ada. All right, I think I picked up on that. Um, to make, to say it again, say it again. When I have fights with my friends. Ah, got it. When I have fights with my friends, or I might point out brothers and sisters, <laughs> siblings, <laughs> what do we do? We try to talk it out. Talk it out. Settle it before it becomes something bigger something more far reaching, something that sometimes is hard to pull back from. Keeping an open mind about people. Keeping an open mind about people. We call people other. That's sort of limiting, isn't it? So we try then to think about other people to think about how they're feeling. This kind of discussion that we're having here can be continued at your lunch table this afternoon with your parents, with your other family members. Okay, we will now sing you to your classes. As you go, may joy surround you as you We will now have another responsive reading. As with the first, I will read and then followed by the congregation. Please stand as you are willing and able. We affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. We affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. We believe that all people should be treated fairly. We affirm and promote acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth. We believe that our churches are places where all people are We affirm and promote a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We affirm and promote the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process. We We affirm and promote the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. We will be a for a peaceful, fair, and free world. We affirm and promote respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. I am pleased to offer The Past is Prologue, which is an introduction to the work of Kurt Tucholsky. Kurt Tucholsky was a satiric journalist and essayist of the 1920s and the early 1930s writing in Berlin. Program notes 
are uh, printed on the order of service in case you want to understand a little bit more about the time period, Kurt Tukolsky, and the music you are hearing today. He wrote as an admired, admired <laughs> public voice. What you will see this morning is an scripted version that will present some of his writings as readers' theater. This will supplant the homily. The setting is a morning TV talk show. Good morning, all you faithful viewers. Welcome to It's All in One's Perspective. This morning's show promises to be one of satire, both humorous and biting. It is a delight that we have the three great granddaughters of Kurt Tukolsky with us to share our time together as they present excerpts from his writings. This is Susan, my co-host for this morning's entertainment. Good morning. I will have these courageous, creative women, Katia, Irene, and Hannah, introduce themselves and their great-grandfather to, to, oh, uh, Papa Kurt. Immediately following this short break, take it away, Jim. The proud sponsor of It's All in One's Perspective is Black. Black is all you need for whatever ails you. It brings instant relief from all those personal problems never shown on TV. Ask your doctor for a prescription for today. The side effects are too numerous to mention, but they're provided in the prescription. Ah, uh, Todd, my, my, my Damon, would you please tell us a bit about yourselves and why you are here in the United States? And how did you get on I I O A P? I am Kate. Yes, we are cousins from different parts of Europe, and each of us has a profession that is in part related to our great grandfather's influence. I am a professor of modern history and teach at To Begin University. I'm Hannah, and I'm a journalist. I had discovered some of, as you say, Papa Court's papers, and I shared them with my cousins. These brought us together after three generations. Well, Hannah and I are sisters, actually. <laughs> We're both living in Sweden because um, Papa Court fled Berlin with his family when being a Jew and satirical essayist. And a journalist became too dangerous. The move to Sweden was necessary. Our family gradually became more Swedish than German. But as uh, Papa Kort said, he would have liked to be a citizen of Europe. Oh, yes, to answer an earlier question. I am Reina and a Jungian psychotherapist. Papa Kort died there in 1935. Thank you. As they are here to represent the work of their famous great-grandfather and to share his work and his insights with an American audience, they might have come really close. You mentioned that your Papa Court was from Berlin. Oh, right. Uh, before the Nazis came to power during the Weimar period, that government collapsed in 1918 resulting in political turmoil. Yes, right after World War II. Or was it the other one? I don't know. Wasn't that a period of great unrest, upheaval, uh, unsettling? Court uh, Papa Court, was, as we said, an essayist and a journalist of some note. In his time, the right-wingers called him a cultural Bolshevik, but on the other hand, the Bolsheviks didn't think much of him either. He insisted on democracy and freedom of discussion, and
and the communists called him a sellout to the bourgeoisie. They, of course, thought they had discovered the key to save the world. Well, you know how people love to label others, to slide them into prescribed boxes and to close the lid. If that's not an... Robert, I know what you mean. But really, how did he think of himself? Well, I believe he called himself a liberal and a socialist, but the Socialist Party didn't embrace him either, according to his personal letters to friends in Sweden. You see, from the time the Socialists made a pact with the military after World War I, which they said was to restore a public order, Papa Court gave them hell all the time. You can imagine why he wasn't so popular in Berlin. He, was, he even offended his fellow Jews. They accused him of being anti-Semitic. His letters reveal so much about him and his personality. One time he wrote that I have succeeded in doing all that I have succeeded in doing in my lifetime was to antagonize everybody. Katya, what was it that he said about writing in English? Do you remember? Uh, yes. Uh, English is a simple but difficult language. It consists entirely of foreign words which are mispronounced. <laughs> I have found, ladies, that portions of your great, your Papa Court's essays are quite in, incisive and epigrammatic. Were they possibly written by one of those, like, you know, one of those um, EpiPads? I, 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 I don't think so, Susan. The ballpoint what? wasn't invented yet. To your point, Robert, yes. Uh, his writings uh, contain many epigrams. We have selected some to share for the amusement of your audience, if we may. Of course, that should liven things up. Man is created through natural means, but he finds these unnatural and doesn't like to talk about them. He is produced without, however, being asked if he wants to be produced. Besides the drives to eat and drink, man has two passions. To make noise and not to listen. <laughs> well, men may be, but certainly not women. I mean, men are people who never listen. I read that somewhere. <laughs> you read it in the prop notes for this morning. Just as we read that there's a thing about women. It's here in the notes. Men, but I'm sure he meant women, like to hear promises, flattery, acknowledgments, and compliments. Actually, we must remember that Papa Court was writing in a time when the use of the word man referred to humankind, both genders. Now we must turn back to our guests. Have you any other epigrams to share? Thank you. We appreciate your reminding your viewers that the language has changed in recent years, even though the attitudes obviously haven't kept pace. For instance, a man does begrudge his species everything, so he devised laws. If he can't, the others shouldn't either. Remember this one? Man is an omnivorous creature. He eats both plants and animals. Now and then on the North Pole expeditions, he even eats some of his own species. That happened in the early 70s and EMDs. Remember that airplane went down and the guys had to resort to eating each other, their frozen legs and fingers. Oh my God! It's just to stay alive. It, it, it's just that, to stay alive. It's so gross. No, no, I'm not listening. Not listening anymore. No. Susan, I know it can be looked at with revulsion, but actually, it was a heroic thing to do because it saved those who had survived the downing of the plane. Papa Kirk was prescient when he wrote. Men are political animals who prefer to spend their lives balled up in their own clumps. 
Each clump hates the other clumps because they are the other. And each hates its own clump because it is its own. The latter hate is called patriotism. Every man has a liver, a spleen, two lungs, and a flag. All four organs are important to life. There supposedly are men without a liver, without a spleen, and with only one lung. There are no men without a flag. Epigrams certainly show Papa Court's wit, but there is depth in his prose as well. Would you please share portions of some of those prose pieces with our audience? This one is one of my favorites. When man senses that he can't claw his way any higher by devious means, then he becomes pious and wise. He renounces the sour grapes of the world. This is called soul searching. The various age levels of man behave toward each other like different races. The old ones have usually forgotten that they were young or forget that they are old. And the young ones never comprehend that they can become old. Professors and students prove this all the time. Oh, another piece. What is family? The family, familia domestica communis, occurs in Middle Europe and usually persists in that state. It is a grouping of many people of varying sex, all of whom see it as their principal duty to stick their noses into your business. The family knows everything about its members. When little Carl had the measles, whether Inga is satisfied with her dressmaker, when Irma will marry the electrical engineer, that Jenny is back with her husband for good after the last spat. Such intelligences are disseminated over defenseless telephone lines between 11 o'clock and 1. The family knows everything and automatically <laughs> disapproves. Other savage tribes are either on the warpath or they're smoking the peace pipe. The family can do both simultaneously. Defenseless telephone lines? What is that? Old telephones used to have lines. Like, like, I don't even know. What does that even I'll, mean? I'll tell you later. The essay from which I just read was written in 1932. It was preceded by The Fetus Speaks Out, which our great-grandfather wrote in 1927. They all look out for me, the church, the state, the doctors and judges. I'm supposed to grow and thrive here. I'm supposed to slumber for nine months. I'm supposed to let well enough alone. They wish me the best. They protect me. They watch over me. Saints preserve that my mother should do anything to me. He who touches me will be punished. My mother will be thrown into prison and my father right after her. The doctor who did it will have to stop being a doctor. The midwife who helped will be locked up. Oh, I am such a precious item. Yes, they all look out for me, the church, the state, the doctors, and the judges, for nine months. But when my nine months are up, it's up to me to see how I can get by from there. Tuberculosis. No doctor helps me. Nothing to eat. No milk. The state does nothing. Suffering and emotional trouble. The church comforts me, but I can't eat that. I'm starving, but if I steal, it will be the judge who stuffs me into jail. For 50 years of my life, no one will give a damn about me. It's all up to me. For nine months, they fall all over me. They fall all over themselves to see that nobody fails me. 
I ask you, isn't that a curious form of welfare? I understand that the next essay you plan to share is called A Lamp Glows. Written in 1931, 14 years before the firebombing of London, Dresden, and Hiroshima. Jim, what's so special about all these foreign places? I mean, this is America, the United States of America, these, let me say. These people are what? not from the United States. But you're right, this is becoming a little tiring. Who's on the guest list for you? Why are Papa Cord's essays about this country? Yes. Boring. Which one of you will start off with for this, I'm sure, a rev revelatory and likely searing piece? Thank you, Robert. If you will imagine this scene, on some forsaken street corner, a young man, 23 years old or so, will lie groaning as he struggles with a deadly poison spread through the city by a war plane. He coughs, his eyes are popping out of their sockets. In his mouth is a repulsive taste and his lungs sting as if he were trying to breathe underwater. Then this young man will lift a bewildered gaze upwards over the building to the heavens and ask, why? Well, young man, because once, for example, in a bookstore, a soft green lamp glowed. It illuminated, young man, a display of war books. The first assistant had draped them elegantly about the softly glowing lamp, and the bookstore had won a prize for this show window which was as tasteful as it was patriotic. Because, young man, your parents and grandparents never made the slightest attempt to get out of this war filth and this national madness. They were content. Please don't die yet, young man. I want to tell you this. You're beyond helping anyway. You see, they were content at best to register a general temperate protest against war. Never, however, against the one that their so-called fatherland waged, was waging, was about to wage. You see, they were poisoned in school, in church, and what's more important, in movie theaters and the press, as poisoned by nationalism as you are, lying there hopelessly. They sincerely believed in the stupid religion of the fatherlands, and they either didn't know how their own country was arming for war, secretly or openly, depending on the circumstances, or they knew it and approved. Oh, how they approved. And that's why you lie there, young man. What's that you're gasping, young man? Mother? Oh, not her. Your mother, country, your mother country was first a wench, and then a mother. And because she was a wench, she loved warriors, and state murders, and flags, and slim trim lieutenants. Don't shout now, it's true. And because she loved him, and hated anyone who would spoil her pleasure, and because she loved her pleasure so, for there is no public success without the mother, the liberal press, who were too cowardly to box their own reporters' ears, fell all over themselves to praise war or to half defend it. And the press cut off the link to anyone who would call war a degrading carnage. And because your mother loved war, a whole industry grew up to cater to her, and someone erected that softly glowing lamp. His shop window was decorated so beautifully. There lay the books that trumpeted the praises of war, the hymns of murder, the psalms of the gas and germ grenades. That's why, young man, 
I see. I, I see that the segment you're presenting next is called Salute Forward. Apparently, this was an open letter to future generations like ours now. Tukolsky wrote this in 1926. We shall see how prescient he was. Robert, how many of our viewers do you think are going to believe that Papa Court could possibly know who our president is today? I say none. We'll have to wait and see how this turns out, won't we? Does, by the way, president, president does that come from the Greek? Or Which one of you will read this letter, salute, forward? Robert, perhaps you'd like to share this reading with me. In fact, why don't we all share in reading this letter? Let us begin. You are browsing in the library, and by some coincidence, you find this volume. You stop short and read. I am embarrassed. You are wearing a suit whose style is very different from mine back then. You wear your brains quite differently also. I begin speaking three times each time with a different subject. Somehow I have to reach you. Each time I have to give it up. We don't understand each other. Doubtless, I am too insignificant. I am buried up to my neck in my own times. I can just see from head level, a little beyond the marker. There, there I know it. You, you are laughing at me. Everything about me seems old fashioned, my way of writing, my grammar, and my attitudes. Don't look down on me, I don't like it. In vain, I try to tell you how it was with us. Nothing. You smile. My voice resounds impotently out of the past, and you know everything better. Should I tell you what moved people in my time capsule? Geneva, Shaw Premiers, Thomas Mann, television, a steel island in the ocean as a stopover for airplanes. You snort at everything and the dust flies a meter high. You recognize nothing for all the dust. Should I flatter you? I can't. Naturally, you haven't solved all the problems, a League of Nations or a United States of Europe. Questions are not solved by mankind, they are merely laid aside. Naturally, you have 300 more futile machines than we had, and for the rest, they are just as foolish and just as smart as we. What did we leave behind? Don't grope around in your memory for what you were taught in school. The remaining is that which remained accidentally, yeah. that which is so neutral it survived. Of what was really great, maybe about half, and nobody pays attention to that, only on Sunday morning a little bit and in the museum. It is as if today I would try to talk to someone from the Thirty Years' War. From the what? When people, although they are no wiser, have grown weary, when all the disputes about fascism and communism have fought themselves out, and when the last freedom-loving emigrants are gone, then one day it will become very modern again to be liberal. Then will appear someone to make an astounding discovery. He will discover the individual. He will say, there is an organism called humankind, and it is the nature of all things. And whether it is happy, that is the question. That it is free, that is the goal. 
I thank you, Kate, Hannah, and Irena, for an illuminating voice from the past. We do need reminding now and again that the past is prologue, unless people like you come forward to share the warning. Kurt Tukowski wrote with irony and satire so that we might listen. until we are together again.